Kindle. A, a Kindle a electronic ebook. The remarkable part about that is that most people don't know there's a cell phone in there. We help design that and, and that system. So it's a systems approach we're, we're bringing to this world and working with uh, the ecosphere from end to end, trying to figure out how we get this data where it needs to go and what the optimal devices are. Uh, my name is Deepak Ayagari, and I work for Sharp Corporation. It's a consumer electronics company. And for the last four or five years, uh, my primary focus has been working with a team of uh, research engineers uh, developing mobile chronic disease management solutions for the consumer, you know, things that are light, wearable, and really innovative. But the last year uh, or so, I've moved from a, a technical leadership role to living in Washington, D.C., trying to address uh, many of the challenges which are non-technical to bring this these technologies to market, you know, which are government-centric, uh, regulatory uh, challenges, as well as uh, reimbursement issues. So uh, that's the angle that I've been working for last year. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the, the displays that you're seeing here, and unfortunately it's on the small screen here, we're, we're not able to get it up on the, on the big screen here. What we're actually showing here is that each three of the panelists are wearing what we call pulse oximeters. Uh, it's really measuring their heart rate. So as you see them answer questions, you're going to see their heart rate go up and down. <laughs> we affectionately call it the stress test. It was originally called the lie detector test. <laughs> so anyway, uh, one of the things that we like to start with, though, is you know there is a lot of things that are going on in the industry today. Not only in the U.S., there's also a lot of spending going on in European Commission countries as well. But uh, the first question I want to pose to the panelists is, if you had a billion dollars, where would you put your money? I'll start here with yeah. Okay, uh, so um, it sounds like we all agree that there is great promise in connected health, the devices, the clinical stuff, hands down, we agree. The complication is that, you know, doing that is different. It's not the natural way we work our lives or interact with uh, clinicians, doctors, and nurses today. And so for me, I'd spend it in three places. The first place I would spend it is in building a clinical fulfillment system, a new one. The second place is I would spend it in a different kind of communication platform, and the third thing I would do is do kind of a free program to do a large-scale demonstration with important populations. So a little bit about each of these. By clinician fulfillment program, what I mean is this. When you go see your doctor today because you have high blood pressure or you have a mass, someone has already figured out what you need to do to work that up and how you treat it. We need to do that with these devices. Similar to the way there was once a time when if you had to have your appendix taken out, you had to go to surgery, they opened up your belly and took it out. And laparoscopes came and someone figured out, hey, here's how you train for this, here's the protocols, you know, here's how you do that. Telehealth ought to be the same way. Because frankly, there are devices today like these that give real-time data. And the way we are trained to practice as physicians doesn't involve real-time data. We need to figure that out. So that's the first place I would put it. And that means that you would have to figure out not only the right kind of doctors and nurses, but other staff who are right to do it and train them up to do it and then provide them incentives to make a good living doing it while the market catches up. The second one, in terms of the different kind of action platform, if you've ever seen clinical systems, um, they look, you know, they're nothing like what we use on the web today. What we need is a kind of platform that lets an individual control and post his or her personal health data, percent oxygen level, heart rate, blood pressure, whatever that person wants, and let that individual engage with others as easily as we can do with video clips and pictures on Facebook and other places. We need that kind of platform. The, the third one around these free programs is, you know, this is new. And when something is new, especially because we, uh, as a previous panelist said, we tend to be cost uh, conscious in these environments. You have to let people use it for free so they can figure out how it works into their kind of normal flow. And I would suggest that we, there are three populations in particular we ought to give free devices to with the free clinician service to help people understand how it works and get excited about it. The first population is I would give it to legislators and legislative aides. <laughs> we are a highly regulated environment and in all seriousness it's important for those people to get it so that they can figure out how to work with us to pave the way so that this happens more easily. The third, the, the second I would say we ought to give it to poor persons in the U.S. And, and other places because, frankly, in this healthcare environment, especially the U.S., where it's so expensive, these are the individuals who need it the most and the people who are most excited about it and the most likely to participate in having a study for the good of society. The third group, I would give it to celebrities. 
there is a reason why there's a huge competition for things to get in the swag bags for the Emmys and the Oscars. If you have celebrities use it and they get excited about it, I mean, think about how trends get started. So those are the three ways I would do it. A new kind of clinical fulfillment system, a new communication platform, and kind of an extended free trial period. Thank you. Works. Very good. I thought about it, first of all, a billion sounds a lot, but in, in big scale, grand scale of things, it's really not. You know, that's, that's one of the issues, I guess. I thought about it a little bit, and I think I would spend it actually in improving the penetration of broadband. And you, you were right on it. We, we are, most of us live, live in metropolitan areas, or uh, urban areas, suburban areas, so broadband is not a problem. But if I tell you there's a study out there that, five, that the United States ranks, on, ranks 20 among 58 countries in the world when it comes to broadband penetration, that should tell you the story. When we talk about interoperability, it's just one part. If you can't, don't have a solid, reliable backbone and infrastructure for ER, EMRs, EHRs, it is not going anywhere. If you want to transport all the information just, just talked about and want to get it to the people in a cost-effective and efficient way, an effective way, you need a very good system. And I think that's where I would like to, to spend money. And it's the poor people. I mean, I have a friend of mine, he spends about twice as much as I do for connectivity because he relies on satellites. And he still has latencies. He still has low, low data rates. And, and you know, trans, transmitting all this data needs broadband. That's how I would spend it. At least Kickstarter. Uh, billion dollars. It really isn't that much. And uh, I'd throw it in quite a few different buckets. The first I'd look at, right now there's plenty of money going into the electronic health record system. Uh, the, this industry needs to get digitized first and foremost, that's great, but there are lots of places that no one's looking at that we need to start paying attention to. One is the system's broken. Uh, the, the, our, the whole Western system is based upon, get, once you're sick, you go in. Well, what if you could have kept from getting that ill to be, enter, uh, to be administered? And then once you're coming out, there really aren't many systems in place to monitor you. Uh, one of the largest uh, fees right now, I think it's post-heart -op, post operation payment, uh, patients, a great proportion of them come back within 30 days, and the cost is enormous at $60,000. So as we look around, there are lots of returns on investment. Uh, it'll take a while for, for some of the, the insurance companies and others to get to it, but the first place I'd look at would be some of the startups that are developing technologies that, that, that measure biometrics inexpensively. Right now, we all have these pulse oximeters, and I'm very glad that your system's not working right now, because it's, it's pretty high. But what I can see here is that I probably had too much coffee. I probably stayed out a little late. Probably, probably a lot of you did. But this is just one factor here. This is just uh, uh, SpO2 and, and um, heart rate. We need systems, and they're, they're available, that will do the ECG, respiratory rate activity, and these smart systems that will tell me and kind of guide me through the day, or give me feedback. And uh, I, remember I was presenting once at the Department of Defense, and I had an ECG kit on it. Uh, but once again, my heart rate was kind of high against my better judgment. I put the heart rate up there also. But my ECG pattern was flowing along. And, and some, one of the, a couple of the doctors said, hey, we don't want to be overloaded with data. That's just we can't have that with all of our patients. Well, the real idea here, think of a black box of a plane. The doctor's not going to get it unless there's a problem. And also, uh, the day before I presented, I was at a little research firm that was trying to figure out how to commercialize ECG sensors. They thought maybe they'd go to CVS and they'd take a pad, they'd sell a pad so it when you came home at night, you'd sit on there, you'd get through vitals, you'd get respiratory rate, ECG, and some others. And what happened was, uh, one of the guys had three peaks. Now, I'm not, I'm not a cardiologist, but I've seen enough episodes of ER and some of these others to know there should be one peak. And these guys weren't cardiologists either, and they realized this guy had three peaks. So he went in and uh, saved his life. And so the point here is that we might not know all of these, these biometrics, but we need systems that will help us. And what we're talking to some companies that are looking at developing low-cost systems that might have respiratory ECG and others, and what it'll do is it's consumer, a consumer system. And so what happens is maybe once a month for a certain fee, you'll have a doctor take a look at it. But in other words, you'll have more data to manage your own health. That's where it has to start. And I think that there's enough money spent on, in gyms and on, uh, on books, health books, that people want to be healthy. We just don't always have the feedback. Uh, I know more about my car than my body. I mean, I, I, I know, I know the, the voltage of my battery. I don't think I'll ever need that, need that for anything. But the real key here are investing in companies that are looking at the smart systems that will pull it all together to look at the low-cost sensors. That's one. And the next piece is reimbursement. Uh, I was at the eye doctor the other day.